Outbeat on All FM, and with me, Andrew Edwards. And I'm here today with the acclaimed pianist, Andrew Wilde. It's a pleasure and an honour to meet you and to, um, to interview you. Uh, welcome to the programme. Thank you. Now, the background to our conversation today is your forthcoming concert in the Bridgewater Hall, celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Chopin. Can I start with a very sort of basic question? What is it about Chopin's music that attracts you, beguiles you, moves you, stirs you? What I would say is the relationship between Chopin and the piano is the most important relationship. Many of my colleagues and myself feel that Chopin's music is incredibly rich in terms of the feeling of the hands on the keyboard. It strikes us that the music would not exist without the piano. So it's, it's almost as though the music is coming out of this keyboard instrument in terms of the layout of the hands on the keyboard, the shapes of the melodies, which are very memorable melodies. People know them. But actually singing them will be quite difficult. So how is it possible that something that's so melodious and the gift of melody is there, but really from the hands on the keyboard rather than the, the human voice. So it's about the intervals, the way the, the melodies go up and down around the compass of the hand rather than a kind of a human vocal range. And I think this is very interesting. Of course, he wrote pretty much exclusively for the piano, so most pianists are going to be very taken with that, almost flattered that he spent his whole life really on the piano, with a few exceptions. There's a cello sonata and a few bits of chamber music. So really that's the basis of the relationship with Chopin and my instrument. So I just feel really part of that lineage, really. Is there anything to do with, with passion and emotion? Because that's another sort of aspect that, that uh, Chopin moves us, stirs us, can evoke a lot of different um, emotions. I mean, I know a lot of, of composers can, but it's a particular romantic quality to the emotions around Chopin. There is, you're right, Andrew. There's also an incredible sort of economy of expression in Chopin where less is more. I remember reading a chapter in a book Alfred Brendel has written in which he discusses his experience of listening to the French pianist Alfred Courtauld playing the Chopin Preludes and how he can distill the character of a piece, the mood, a setting in a single note. And obviously the, the richness here is that Chopin does that and it's a job as a, an interpreter to actually be able to do that. So these very fleeting, almost aphoristic pieces have these constantly changing moods. And just from the silence between, say, number two and number three, you have to create straight away a different kind of character. Talking of passion and poetry and all these things, I think they're almost apt to be misunderstood in Chopin, you know? This kind of Victorian do you think too much is, Do I think too much is made of them and maybe also the, the glimpse we think we see into the moods of the pianist as well and the emotions of the pianist rather than something about the, the music? I don't know. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, he's apt to be misunderstood. It's very easy to get carried away with the emotion in inverted commas of the music, rather than a kind of all-round view of his music in terms of the sonorities on the piano. You know, the piano is an endlessly fascinating instrument. It's always conjuring up ideas, which actually it shouldn't be able to do, but can. One can spend one's whole day just trying to find uh, the different sounds and colours and combinations and balance of the piano. How, how much time do you spend practising, rehearsing, exercising? Give, give us a, a flavour of, of what that's like for you on, on an average sort of day, whether you're preparing for a concert or not. Yeah, I'm invariably preparing for something. And there's no fixed rule, but as I get older, I do see the need for breaking up the practice into different kinds of work things that 20 or 30 years ago I may have taken for granted technically. I don't think that's a realistic prospect today. And I'm kind of just taking measures really to make sure that, you know, in the next 5, 10, 20 years, these things won't damage the message that what the interpretation one is trying to reach. So I do like to do some slow practice, pinpoint difficult, perhaps knotty, passages in the works. Is it something about repeating phrases, repeating It's about bars. repeating, 
it's about getting it absolutely fluent with minimal effort really i mean physical minimal physical effort and about trying to memorize in a sense the balance of sound so for example a chord with say seven or eight notes in a vertical chord trying to understand that certain notes within that chord are more important than others and how to get the pressure of say the fourth finger when the hand is playing five notes the right hand is playing five notes and the fourth finger needs slightly more pressure simultaneously this is the real work and it is about relaxing and communing with the sound total immersion and concentration to be able to realize that and then of course it's one thing doing it at home in you know practice session and quite another going to the concert hall and just doing it can i ask you about performance you've mentioned that you know you the piano uh, maybe a cavernous stage and a big auditorium and you've got to concentrate on what you're doing but yet you're in a very public situation and part of the thrill for people of course is you know what are you going to do and how is he going to do it how do you still yourself and centre yourself to kind of not be too distracted by other people's expectations yeah i mean that's a very good question and, and it particularly sort of has personal resonances with me in the past i have been quite distracted by the public and perhaps got something of a reputation for, you know, maybe staring or perhaps um, I shouldn't really say this, but I will. I'll be very open and honest and direct about it all, making no bones of the fact that interruptions can be distracting. Sometimes something dropped on the floor which coincides with a particular note you're playing, you can't hear it, this kind of thing. So I do think it's part of experience and learning from experience and learning how to cope and practicing in one's mind beforehand what can happen how can we live with these extraneous things because after all they're part of life i went to a concert recently and had a bit of a you know bad cough and i almost started a coughing fit myself so i was as it were on the other side and realized that it, these things happen is that what the stress is about then in a way the the fact that you need certain conditions to operate for you to, to perform to your best and you can't control all of them or is is it actually any concerns about you know will you manage to do what you want to do separate to that yeah i think your very perceptive question about how you know you're on the stage and there's all these people there's a sense of excitement and actually just as they don't know what you're going to do i don't know what they're going to do sometimes it's absolute silence, which happens very often, and particularly the Manchester audience are absolutely marvellous. I've always had great faith in them, and they've always proved to be very, very sensitive and willing to come inside the music, as far as I can tell. That itself, absolute science, can create enormous uh, strain. Are you wondering how is it going to break, or are you focusing on it too much, maybe? Of course, and that in itself can create a sense of stress it's interesting about the idea of preparing mentally i think if time is taken leading up to a major concert particularly where the acoustics very is very lively they're very lively at bridgewater hall which is wonderful so you can hear every movement and everything it's all there in a whole experience just taking time out to think about that enables one to distance oneself slightly but at the same time, get inside the music 100% straight away, from the first note. So there are, there are two states. There's your self-contained state on the stage with the music. And then there's the state, the overall experience within the concert hall and the sound going out into the concert hall and the feedback of that, which includes audience response as because well. Because you're sharing it with you're sharing it with us. I remember there was a lovely piece by Alfred Brennan, a piece of Haydn, mm. and um, it was like he seemed to be having... a great humour with, with, with it and he was like sharing that with us that came across in the plane that was um, sublime yeah. so it's something about you are trying to reach us whilst at the same time not being so distracted or, yeah. or, or disturbed by I mean, us I think in certain cases you, you mentioned that um, about Brendel in Haydn and I probably was at the same concert as you there when, when this was happening he of course was a, a I think a very very good actor as well he understood the psychology involved in performing and what people, and we have vast experience dealing with different kinds of public uh, all over the world and many, many times. And, you know, I would imagine he's pretty much seen it all. Expressions are exquisite. They, they are, are incredible. Really. And I think he, more than, you know, many people, knew how to read the audience. 